Welcome to MHM Podcast Network on moviehousememories.com. Podcast for pod people. Our feature presentation begins now. Welcome back to another episode of Movie House Memories, the podcast where we look back and review the films that we think are the most important films in cinema history. I'm Patrick, and with me, as always, are three people who spend a large portion of their lives in darkened movie theaters. First, he's the host of the number two review podcast here on the MHN Podcast Network and the author of Duty on Our Empire, a 25th century love story. You can follow him on Twitter at Haley Creative. The end to my M, my right hand man and partner in crime, Chris Haley. Uh, quit marking up my back, will you? It's uh, starting to ruin my reputation around here. Also with us, she's one of the co hosts of Sunday Seconds with the Duke, the John Wayne retrospective podcast, which can be heard every second Sunday of the month here on MHN. The sole female voice of the show and my podcast better half, Lori Flores. Hello. Finally, he is the co-host of Male Bonding, the James Bond retrospective podcast that is entering its final year on the MHN Podcast Network. Uh, you can follow him on Twitter at Haybucker. He's the youngest member of our group and the man who didn't know there was such a thing as child pedophiles, Matt Palmer. You know, in high school, I was known as the safe cracker and the meatball sandwich. All right. Welcome, everyone. And before we get Did you to- get those at the same time? <laughs> I was really proud of that one. I was trying not to laugh. <laughs> all right welcome everyone and before we get started we'd like to thank all the of the returning listeners to the show and welcome all new listeners to movie house memories thanks for downloading us and giving us a try we appreciate your time and attention and hope you can keep on listening and following us on facebook at movie house memories or on twitter at mh memories on either one of those two social media outlets you can keep up on our occasional written film reviews, news on upcoming theatrical releases, and information on many upcoming podcasts on the MHN Podcast Network, including this show, Movie House Memories, or one of the growing number of sister shows like Lunchtime Movie Review, The Number Two Review, Mail Bonding, Sunday Seconds with the Duke, and of course, our latest podcast, Movie House Concessions. And whether you're a frequent listener or a brand new fan of our little show, we hope that you take the time after you're done listening and provide us with a little feedback. You can do this one of two ways. If you've downloaded us off either iTunes or Stitcher, you can go onto one of those two platforms and rate our podcast and leave a little comment about the show. Additionally, you can also visit our website at moviehousememories.com and leave a comment about either our podcast, our opinions, or the film that we are reviewing. Also at the website, you can leave your star review rating of the film we have discussed so that we can get a consensus rating from the MHN Podcast Network community. As always, we'd love to hear your positive feedback, but we appreciate anything anyone has to say about any one of our little shows. Now, with that horrible business out of the way, let's get on to this week's review of one of the greatest films, one of the nominated greatest films of all time, Chris's next pick, M from 1931. And Chris, do you have a summary? Yes, I do. Is it in it's German? A <laughs> What's that? Is it in German? <laughs> no. No sprechen Sie Deutsch. Nein. Can you tell me a story? After a number of unsolved child murders, fear overtakes the city of Berlin. Citizens instantly mob anyone seen talking to a child and label them a murderer. As the pressure mounts on the police to catch the murderer, they up their raids on illegal activities in the city, hoping to find any clue that will lead to the capture of the killer. Soon, criminal organizations join the manhunt, not because it's the right thing to do, but because the increased police presence and shakedowns in the city are hurting their profits. Now, it's not only a rush to capture a child killer, but a rush to see which organization will capture him first, the legal authorities or a bunch of thugs no better than the man they are chasing. The end. Yay! Sorry, I had myself Short on Short and sweet. Yeah, I had myself on well, mute there. It's true. I wanted, uh, you know, I wanted us to start doing uh, spoiler-free summaries, so it kind of makes them a little bit shorter now. Oh, you know what? My news has spoilers. Uh oh. <laughs> Just say spoiler alert before each one. Oh, actually, if it's a news event, I don't know if it's really a spoiler, Lori. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of our listeners don't know that the Germans took power shortly after this. <laughs> or the Nazis. Sorry. The, ah, damn, damn, I, I was that joke. I was reading. I, <laughs> You just that that makes your first joke less uh, funny. Damn it! Uh, this whole podcast is going downhill. It started with child murdering, and I made it worse. All right. 
films are influenced by the times that they're made in, and we look back at some of the big news events of those times in Lori Flores' Headlines of the Time. Spoiler alert. The year was 1931. Spain became a republic with the overthrow of King Alfonso XIII. Gangster Al Capone was sentenced to 11 years in prison for tax evasion. The Star Spangled Banner officially became the U.S. national anthem. The Empire State Building was completed. The Whitney Museum of American Art opened to the public with 700 pieces of art. General Motors Frigidaire made refrigerators a common household appliance. My grandmother um, still called the refrigerator a Frigidaire for as, lo- as long as she lived. That's why I put that little fact in there. In honor of Grandma Gladys. The Great Depression was in full swing. In 1931, food riots began to break out in parts of the U.S. New York's Bank of the United States collapsed. At the time, the bank had over 200 million in deposits, making it the largest single bank failure in U.S. history. In theaters, double features emerged as a way for the unemployed to occupy their day. Playing in theaters and double features were films such as City Lights, Frankenstein, Dracula, The Public Enemy, and Chris's pick, Fritz Lang's M. And that's a look at 1931. All right. We usually start by talking about the casting of the film, and uh, the lead, I guess, in this film is the the killer himself, Peter Lorre, playing Hans Beckert. Chris, what your film? So why don't you start us off with uh, what did you think of Peter Lorre in this film? I know you're a fan. You 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 expressed how much you like Peter Lorre when we reviewed the TV version of Casino Royale. Well, you know. Uh What's funny is probably the my first introduction to him, and maybe for you guys as well, because he was a Warner Brother actor. Was Warner Brothers uh, featured him in another number of cartoons with Bugs Bunny, and uh, there was like three or four of them that I can remember as a kid, and that was my first introduction to Peter Lorre. But um, he was also on Scooby Doo. <laughs> was he on Scooby? I don't remember that one. <laughs> but uh, I think he played this. This role chillingly well. I think it, it as uh, Patrick has mentioned in the notes, it, it kind of followed him through his whole career in, in some ways that isn't necessarily positive because he did such a good job and people associated him with the child killer for quite some time. But I don't think anybody could have done a better job in this role. I'm going to echo what Chris said. He... Um, he was perfect in this role. And I also have always loved Peter Laurie. And I don't remember why. I think I, I liked <laughs> monster movies maybe. And, and he was in a lot, he, he was in a lot of those and played the villain in a lot of older horror movies. So that maybe that's why I like him. Um, but, but I agree. He was, he was perfect for this role. I can't imagine anybody else playing it. And, and I'm sorry that it limited his, his roles in later life, but I still think he had a successful career. I think he had a very successful career. Yeah. I think a lot of actors would be happy with that one. Yeah. He was really good. He was really good and, and ahead of his time. I um, I really liked it. I, I thought that uh, the end where there he's he's kind of bearing his soul to everyone. Um, I thought it was it was a really good performance for any time, and um, I give him I give him high marks. Yeah, definitely the strength of this film and, you know, not even knowing that Peter Lorre was in it. Uh, this was an unknown. I mean, I knew of a film called M, knew nothing about it, who directed it, what it was about, who was in it. Uh, kind of surprised when I saw Peter Lorre in it and I was like, oh, I, you know, this is a foreign film. I didn't know that he wasn't, uh, you know, I, well, I knew he wasn't American, but I saw him in so many American roles that I thought he came up through the Hollywood system. I didn't know that he started off as kind of an inter- international actor, and and he is absolutely the best performance in this film. And I agree with every, what everyone said; it's very, very captivating in the role. But what about Otto Warnicki playing Inspector Carl Lohman? 
Just pronounce it like you're John Wayne. You can say it any way you want. Wow. I'm going to say Inspector Carl Homan. <laughs> um, he was fine. I mean, I don't think there was anything remarkable. But, you know, it was, it was a straight character to Peter Lorre's amazing performance. But he didn't really stand out to me. No, same as Lorre. It, it was, you know... It's something I think most actors could have done, and it wasn't bad at all, but it it wasn't memorable. I agree with that, but the actor actually got a, I think, a couple of films off of this as the same character. What? So he 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 um worked it, playing the same character in other films. Really? Mm-hmm. I didn't see that yeah. in my research. German films. Um, let me look real quick on IMDb so I'm not uh, <laughs> making that, but I do believe. That he was, well, you you go you go on, but I'm going to look this up. But I'm I swear he got a couple of roles based on his playing the same character. But he kind of gets typecast as that police police officer type character anyway. Yeah, I will agree with that. Is he he plays the cop, and it's mm-hmm. a straight role in this film, not very exciting, and he, he does a, a good job at it, but. It's when you you compare it to kind of what kind of the media role that Peter Lorre has to play, or even the safe cracker, which is a little bit more exciting than just the the cop. Um, I, yeah, I, it, it's kind of an, an uneventful role. Not that it's bad; it's just a, a million other actors could have done it. And uh, the he he was in the his character was in the film The Terror of Doctor Mabuse and um, The Testament. That- of Dr. That's where I saw him before. I'm just kidding. I've never heard of those <laughs> films. So no, it looks like he got this character got about three more films after this, but it looks like they were more in the 60s. Huh. Weird. Yeah. Either that or German writers are just so uncreative they just use the same names over and over again. Oh, that's possible. He'll do. Uh what about Gustav Grungens playing uh Der Scheinaker? Scheinaker? The safe cracker. That's how it, it translates. He was good. Um, and, I, and I think, you know, if we compare him to modern performances, I'd say it was adequate. It was good. But, you know, for someone's first talkie, it was really good. I, I think it was it, it had a lot of a lot of touch that I, I I'm not used to seeing in movies this old. You know, it wasn't it wasn't the greatest performance. But I think if we if we handicapped it for 19 early 1930s, it was fantastic. Well, he was my second favorite character and actor in this film. So I think he did a really good job. He, he's one of Germany's best known actors of that era. So uh, he was pretty much revered, although he might have been a Nazi. So uh, that that would taint his reputation here. But he was a well-known actor of his time. No celebrities save you from Nazis. That's That's true. I agree. I liked him a lot. I thought he did a really good job, and I think that that was an important character. I think it could have, you know, the wrong actor overplaying it or, or making it more of, of a melodrama character could have ruined it. I thought he did a good job. Yeah, I'll agree with that. Is it, it's, uh, He's definitely more interesting than Inspector Lohman, uh, or the actor playing Inspector Lohman. Uh, that there's there's more to play with in that role, and uh, you know, so not trying to talk badly about the guy who played the cop. It's just this is the criminal, and he's trying to track down another criminal. That it's just a little bit more interesting of a character. So uh, I, I think it's a better written character as well. So it's something for the the actor to grab onto. All right, what about the, you know this is directed by Fritz Lang, who was famous for directing a lot of silent films before turning his attentions to the talkies this being his first one uh chris you know what do you have to say about fritz lang and his approach in this there there's even moments of silence in this film like it goes back to that dead silence no music no nothing for you know if you don't expect it you might think there's something wrong with your your television because it's complete silence but i i like a lot of fritz lang's films uh one we're going to be reviewing shortly is metropolis which is another favorite of mine this of course was his first uh talking film and his wife i don't know if it was his wife at the time but thea von harbo co-wrote this with him 
And so um, it was a family affair at the time. And I think that there was a lot of care put into this. Um, as you put in the notes, he was not very nice to his actors. And I don't think I get the impression Peter Lorre did not like uh, working for him. But as far as his movie making style, his noir style and use of mood and setting and everything, it's pretty much unmatched for this day and time. And it, it's, I think it stands out just visually among any film today. I, I can't imagine that this, di- this film didn't influence Alfred Hitchcock in some way. I, I just think it's brilliant. He made this film so scary and, and such a successful psychological thriller. As you mentioned, the dead silence. Well, I think the silence said so much more than words could have done and set such a tone. It was a terrifying movie. I mean, that scene where the balloon disappears said so much. You knew exactly what happened to that poor child without the, you know, um, sometimes I think modern horror films go too far and then it just becomes cheesy and slasher and, and you lose the effect. But I, I think it's more frightening the way that Fritz Lang told this story than, than I, I can't imagine it being told in a more frightening way. Yeah, I, I kind of had some, some beef with them. The beginning of the film was really intense and I thought really spooky. But I also think this movie was about 20 minutes too long. And he kind of lost his way towards the middle there. And I got a little bored towards the middle. I think it it started really well and it ended really well. And he got some, some good performances. But I think I think it was just this movie was longer than the story called for. Wait till we review Metropolis. <laughs> you know, I... I agree with like a lot of things Chris said. His, the way he sets the mood in this, even the way he lights this film, is just just so um, pitch perfect for it that it it, it creates an atmosphere of uh, psychological terror that I think is you don't see in a lot of 1930s films. You just don't. And you know, Laurie's you know statement of this influenced Hitchcock. I, without a doubt, it probably influenced Hitchcock, Hitchcock because I, I could see a lot of similarities, especially in his use of lighting. Uh, and shadowing of characters that it just it's just so makes it just you know scary and it's not really it's not a frightening hor- i mean the, the subject matter is horrifying but the way it's shot is not to scare you it's it's very much like to inform you and it is it's just i i was blown away by the film because i, I to, to to have a child murderer possibly a child pedophile you know, basically be a lead character in a film in 1931 is just, I, I would never have thought that this film would, had been made. And obviously it was not made in the Hollywood system. It was made overseas, but it's definitely uh, something that it's, it was a taboo subject at that point in time. O- audiences did not, w- were not going to flock to go see this. Not when you have uh, other more, I guess, uh, engrossing, entertaining films. It's not a film that will you want to go seek out to kind of forget about the the depression for an no. hour and a half. Yeah, especially yeah, ni- 1930s. Were any of you kind of creeped out in the scene where they put the camera underneath the inspector's desk and you're basically looking up his crotch to his face? That yeah, was that it's was, a very uncomfortable scene. It was very uncomfortable. Yeah, there was a whole lot of crotch there too. <laughs> Lori liked that scene, but that's okay. <laughs> no comment. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty much all you can say, You know Lori. what's horrible is it didn't... I don't remember that vividly, so it apparently didn't mean as much to me as it did to you boys. <laughs> well, it's let's go a- from Lori's lack of morality to Matt's moral <laughs> universe. <so. laughs> yeah, I, I thought... Two points I would make: the the little, the very short little exchange at the at the very end of the movie between the two moms, not too subtle, but just kind of this this cry for moms to parents to to watch their children more to prevent these things in the first place. I don't know why 
that would have been a thing. I, mean, I don't know if there was a, this was a problem or there was a lot of anxiety over this or there had been some some abductions recently, but it it seemed like a not too subtle point the movie wanted to make to parents of small children. The other one I was I was kind of interested that it was the same the same um, you know criminal justice well not not criminal but you know justice among criminals that still exists today of um, people who hurt children are unacceptable even to, to hardened criminals and burglars and murderers and things like that it persists to today to the point where you know sex offenders are segregated in prison because they're not safe among the general population most of the time so uh, it was still there you know in the early 1930s in this movie and there you know there was a practical element to it that they wanted to do business and they couldn't do business but i, I think the reason they had no problem finding this guy themselves and were willing to you know, whatever stomp them to death with mob violence was because um, people who hurt children are subhuman, even to the, you know, the, the most hardened parts of society. Well, I agree with that. I mean, they threw him in a kangaroo court. Um, it was it was mainly a, a jury of his peers, which were criminals. Uh, it's a very interesting speech that he gives at the end saying that that it, w- it was their choice to break the law, but he couldn't control his urges, so he shouldn't be held to the same standards in many ways. But yeah, w- one of the things that I found interesting was, uh, as Matt just said, that the, the the mom at the end was was basically pleading to watch your children, whereas the, the mom in the kangaroo court was basically saying kill him because that's what any mom would do she would that would be the only way for justice when when the the mom in the the real courtroom was saying it doesn't matter what the verdict is that's not going to bring back my child so it was interesting how the two moms were were uh put against each other or juxtapo- juxtaposed in in their what they were saying yeah it was it was definitely interesting um i did find the the criminal court a little disturbing and and creepy just just the way they were all you know circling him it was kind of barbaric kind of the way they they yelled and stuff but then his defense was so creepy it was just that that was one of the scariest moments in the film for me was was that what did you call it uh kangaroo court kind of kangaroo court yeah what why did you find it scary just that the mob mentality or the fact that his argument could be seen as compelling I think it was scary the the mob mentality, um, and then at the same time it was kind of it was kind of nice to see these people trying to save the kids and how they all work together to find him. I liked that part of it, but just that's just such a that's such a creepy defense. I mean, for him to say, "Oh, I can't help it," so I, I just is that a, is that a real defense that is used? Well, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know about Germany in the 1930s, but that wouldn't work now. Well, it, it wouldn't and, work against. Well, wasn't the a jury. reason of insanity defense? He was basically trying to plead in front of them. That's essentially his argument: is he can't control himself. It's that he's compelled to do it. Well, then put yourself away. Well, and I, I think it was interesting, you know, between the two moms and the two courts. In one of the one of the courts, the moms got to you know kick this guy literally and in the other one they kind of had to watch and and see if he was going to get committed to an asylum and you know in one of them justice was worth it and the other one justice was you know insufficient <laughs> you know I, there is kind of a real a real bloodlust at play there I think mm-hmm. in the civilized world uh, he was going to get committed and possibly set free in an undetermined amount of time after he was cured Whereas in the in the mob kangaroo court, he he would have been swift justice. We don't care if you're crazy; we're killing you, and that way our profits will return to us in our criminal activity. Well, I would have answered him if you knew you had a problem and you knew it was wrong, then get help. Well, he did because the reason they found him was um, people that were risen, orig- had been recently released from psychiatric facilities. So he had been in there, and they focused in on on um, on people who had harmed children. So he was definitely in a facility for some reason, whether he went for it by himself or like what the um, what the 
uh, criminals were saying that he would just get out in a few years after they said he was all better and then just go back into society to kill again. So, you know, which way did it go? Was he released uh, to to kill again or was he actually cured? Which, I mean, he killed some kids, so no, he wasn't. But, you know, he was he was in a facility of some sort for some time. And I don't think the movie was big on treating people like him. I, I think... Um, you know, I think the movie wanted him to get mob justice more than it wanted him to, to get sent to an asylum anyways. I think, you know, I, I, didn't I think... see any remorse. No, and I think the criminals kind of had more of the voice of the story. They're the ones who caught him. They're the ones who were, who were better at everything. And they're the ones who kind of knew where the line was. You know, that, that speech with the with the uh, the meatball sandwich earlier where he was saying, you know, if I shoot a cop or a cop shoots me, it's all business and we know it's the risk, but you know, that that's the kind of thing I think they think deserves a fair trial, but once you start doing things like taking mother's kids, then we're content just to to minimize the risk posed to society. Is the movie's the, the movie's take, I would argue. Chris, what about your uh, symbolism? Well, there's quite a bit in this one. Um, I think one one of the interesting things that I'm sure you noticed was that although the cops were sticking to procedure and doing everything they could, they didn't get results as quick as as the criminals. And I think this was a shot against the ruling party of the time, the, the current government, and how that following their long established rules, they were failing the people. And here, the, these criminals, the, the down-on-the-luck people, the beggars, the um, crippled, uh, they all banded together and they got the job done and they caught this man very quickly. So I think that that's the first symbolic thing, that the government has failed the people and the people have to rise up and save themselves. The second thing um, that I would say is, if you notice, there was a tremendous amount of beggars. There was a lot of cripples in this um, in this film. The cripples, of course, are representing the the huge failure of the German people in World War One, and um, how that how that these people served their country and were basically reduced to cripples and nothing in society that, that had nothing and were basically begging on the streets. So once again, it's a, it's a, sim- a symbolic gesture of the state that the people had had succumbed to as shown by, you know, cripples everywhere. And then, um, let's see, what else did I notice? The, the safe cracker guy, he, he, sim, you know, he symbolized the criminal criminal world's authority over the city. If you notice, he was banging on a map of Berlin symbolizing that was his dominance over the city. And he was the one who actually was in charge getting things done. So it, I think there was just this transition and this guilt from world war one to that current world that would eventually thrust the Nazis into power and uh, start world war two. So it's a very interesting film when you look at it in those terms. Well, I, I don't know if the criminals are really in charge. I think they kind of had like a shadow government, but I think that they still f- feared the police. And, and when the, the police came, you know, they all threw their arms up in the air when they're about to, to um, you know, mob justice, the, um, the child killer. So I, I think the police were in charge. The police just weren't as competent as the criminals. And I think the, the criminals... You know, and I don't know if it's because they didn't have access to the police, but didn't quite need the police or think they needed them because they they kind of had their own. They had it almost like unionized criminal jobs, and they had their little syndicates and every, and they had a lot of order within them. You know, the criminals might not have been above the government, but I think they were so far beneath the the rest of everybody that they they formed their own their fo- their own social order and um, were more effective than the police were. We know Hitler was thrown in jail and was basically considered a criminal when um, he tried to overthrow the government. I mean, so basically he was one of those type of people who eventually rose up and took over the uh, the establishment. So th- those were his people. No, I think I think all, all your points are pretty valid. Uh, that it's a, a legitimate interpretation of what they're what they're trying to convey and what they're trying to say in this. I mean the. The social commentary that, uh, as Matt has kind of already pointed out, the 
the message of mothers watch basically watch your kids is it's i don't want to say it's a, a theme or symbolic it is definitely a theme it's a very overt theme um beat you over the head with it because they literally almost mm-hmm. they literally say it to you but that was one of his you know fritz lang's uh, in, intentions in making this film well you know the the nazis big thing was to recruit to recruit the kids that's mm-hmm. how and to uh turn them against their parents and say you can't trust your parents so yeah you definitely got to watch your kids in that world but I don't think it was the mother's, it wasn't Elsie's mother's fault that she was kidnapped. I mean, she was just waiting for her to come home from school. I mean, we walked to and from school by ourselves. I don't think I, that, that I did, I didn't really think it, they, I think that was just a kind of a proverbial warning to say, you know, be careful. I, I don't think it was the lack of attention from the, um, Elsie's mother anyway. No, I would agree with that. I don't think Elsie's mother did anything wrong, but I think it's just a warning to always be alert, you know, to parents. I mean, we grew up in an era where you know, that you know, kids got snatched all the time. We just didn't hear about it. And every once in a while one would break through and every parent would get paranoid about it. And you know, in this day and age, it it, it happens all it happens all the time, but you have amber alerts and you do have all these things and systems in place to help find the kid locate the kid you know protect the children as much as possible but that just didn't in 1931 it was non-existent Mm -hmm. in the 1970s it was pretty much non-existent so everything was after the fact yeah it's like don't they say it's like within the first 24 hours if you find them there's a better chance but then it decreases yeah Yeah. the longer they're gone and that goes with any kidnapping but Mm -hmm. especially with children well with that happy note let's talk about the ending of the film (laughs) so uh, you know, there no s- s- other endings to this film, but um, the, ultimately, the you know child murderer is captured by the lawful authorities um, after falling into the hands of the criminal element. Did you guys find that satisfying at, at the end of this film, uh, Lori? I'll let you go first. It was just satisfying that he was caught. I, I guess I didn't really care how he was caught. I just didn't want another child harmed. So, yeah, that was satisfying. Well, the idea that if the the mob mentality had won out and actually had implemented their own justice, likely death, would you have been satisfied? No child would have been harmed then. Would would you have found that just as satisfying? I would have preferred that to him escaping, but but it's always best to let justice, lawful justice, be served. I uh, I did not see the ending coming. I thought I, I I kind of felt the building up to the criminals catching him, and I didn't expect there to be this this long, well, not, I mean not overly long, but this long court scene. And I and I didn't think the cops were going to rush in and save him. I thought they were going to like you know torch and pitchfork him to death. And and I was also expecting another drawn out court scene when the police came and took him to the courtroom, and we don't we don't really find out what happens to him. So. I like I like bizarre endings. I like kind of unexpected endings. So I I liked it. I also usually prefer um, people to be a little more subtle with their their themes and their their messages. So you know it's, it was kind of blunt, but I like the I like that they threw a little twist on there and were willing to wrap it up like that so quickly. Well, I think that the point was never to to say what it, the legal authorities how they ruled i mean i would assume that the criminals were were correct and that they sent him to some sort of mental institution but um the the point was uh what what elsie's mom said at the very end of the film that the verdict doesn't matter you need to watch your children because any verdict rendered will not bring your child back and so i think that was in the end that was fritz lang's long drawn out hour and 39 minute message watch your children i somewhat find the police catching him somewhat unsatisfying (laughs) that i kind of like the mob mentality that he hurt the community and the community was lashing back at him and that he would have had his essentially his day in court in front of them that they they didn't just bring him in to kill him they gave him a lawyer they were going to hear arguments and granted i'm pretty sure i knew which way the verdict was going to go if it would have gotten that far 
um, but that they were they were seeking their own kind of justice, and I found that more satisfying than the cops busting in and grabbing them and basically just hauling them off, and we're never really going to know what happens to them. And I, so I was a little disappointed. I would have liked to have seen the mob get their their justice their way. Who was that inspector chasing in the later movies? Was it him? No, they were separate, complete separate oh, okay. movies from what I understand. Oh, did anybody feel sad or bad for Peter Lorre himself in that scene? The actor? I mean, they, they threw him down those stairs. Oh, yeah. I mean, the actor, not the oh. not the, the character. <laughs> but we um, oh, they really did? He looked like he really hurt when, when <laughs> yeah, he, that, they threw him in that pile of wood and he's grabbing his knee. Like, he, he looked like he was in real pain. It wasn't padded? No, I mean, there's a reason why he wouldn't work with Fritz Lang again, and I think it had a lot to do with that scene. Holy cow. I didn't feel sorry for the character because we knew without a doubt that he was guilty. So I didn't feel sorry for him. If I didn't know without a shadow of a doubt that he was guilty, I I may have felt sympathy for him, but I didn't. This is one of the things I do like about this film is you know right from the bat that he's the killer. And it's more about how are they going to catch him versus uh, who did it? That's another good point. All right, let's talk about the film's legacy. Nominated for zero Academy Awards, which I found very surprising. Even Not even Best Foreign Film that year. Uh, AFI acknowledgments? None, because it's not an American film. Included among the 1,001 movies you must see before you die. Uh, Premier Magazine voted this movie one of the 25 most dangerous movies. Uh, M was ranked as number 33 in Empire Magazine's 100 Best Films of World Cinema in 2010. It's currently number 78 on IMDb's top 250 films. Uh, is included in Roger Ebert's greatest movies list. Uh, chosen by the Associ- Association of German and I'm going to cinema, cinema, cin- cinema thieks, as the most important German film of all time. Uh, Rotten Tomatoes has it 100% critics, 100% and 95% audience. So, uh, what do you think of the legacy, and would you put this in your top 100? Who's banging shit? <laughs> Who is I it? hope it wasn't me. Maybe it's me. I'm looking at no, my I off No, I dropped something. Oh. All right. Lori? I'm looking at my Oscar book. Did they have a best foreign film back then? I have no idea. I mean, it's early on I don't the think Oscars. they did. They didn't. Oh, well, there you go. Yeah. Not, yeah, they didn't have best foreign film yet. And I'm not sure how well received this was at the time, though. True. Well, it's a very, it's a very dark subject matter. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I I would agree. I mean, of the of the German films I've seen, I would say, yeah, it's I I think that's an appropriate title, and I I'm putting this in my top 100. I thought it was that that good of a film. I think maybe the the subject matter was may have hurt it, especially at the at the time. Excuse me. Maybe people were wanting to see, um, you know, although monster movies were popular, but this is beyond a monster movie. So I, I think I, I think that the legacy is appropriate, being that it wasn't an American film, so it can't be an AFI and stuff. But it's on the Criterion Collection, which is just as important. And it was listed in one of the movies you should see before you die. Correct. So there you go. And, and Criterion Collection means very little to me because Repo Man is in the Criterion Collection, and that's a horrible <laughs> mill. That's an excellent cult film. It is not. It's a horrible movie. <laughs> it's great. All right, Matt. Do you ever watch Prisoners with... Uh, Hugh Jackman? With, yeah, with Hugh Jackman. Yeah. This, this, yeah, this, this reminds me of that. Too. Yeah, and that was heavy, and I'll never watch it again. <laughs> and uh, But it was really good. Did this, you see that ending coming? No. No. I did not. I, I, this movie, it, it it's not in my top 100, but it's close. And I don't think it'll ever break in. And a lot of it has to do with it was just too long, and I got bored. And um, I think boring me is the one thing I really can't forgive out of a movie. It had great tension. It had, it had um, Peter Lorre's acting is is one of the best performances I, I think I've seen. It's definitely got a top 100 acting performance in it, I think. If you could cut 20 minutes out of this, it, it could have been in my top 100. But it was a little too long. 
Well, as I said at the beginning, I had heard of this film, didn't know a damn thing about it, didn't know the subject matter, didn't know the actor, didn't know the director. Did I just started watching it cold because Chris picked it, and it's one of the it's one of the things I like about doing this podcast, and it's one of the things that I, I, I very seldom does a film grab me and just captivate my interest like this film did and i'm going to put it in my top 100 be just because of that now granted maybe repeat viewings i wouldn't be as fond of it as i am at this moment but i was enthralled in this film from from the get-go and not know and surprised at the subject matter especially in 1931 surprised uh, of peter laurie's performance because I, i've seen him in many things primarily bugs bunny cartoons but it's you know it, I've never known him to be a lead actor. I and I've never known him to be. I, I've never seen him give a performance quite as interesting or as captivating as this. And you know that alone, I just thought it was a fascinating film for the era that it was made in, and well, well, well ahead of its time. So uh, because of that, I definitely put it in my top 100. But it's Chris's film, so he has the final word. Well, I'll agree with Matt that um, saying this film's too long is uh is a legitimate um critique of it i i have heard from people that think it was a little long but i think for me this is peter laurie's finest performance and it just solidifies why i like this guy so much and he's he's an interesting person he brings a lot to the part i mean that scene where he's um where he's staring where he's looking in the in the window at the store display and he sees a a girl alone her reflection through the window and it's almost like a Dr. Jekyll Mr. Hyde transformation right right on screen you know through his eyes he's not talking he he uh it's all complete nonverbal acting and it's a phenomenal performance um showing just how creepy uh, a a serial child serial killer can be and um i think maybe that scene alone uh, would solidify his best performance for me. So I have very little bad to say about this film, and it's definitely in my top 100. It's pretty much the archetype of the psychological thriller as far as I'm concerned. I couldn't see a better example if anybody else can think of something sooner or earlier than this or better. But, uh, yeah, definitely in my top 100. Have you ever wondered if Peter Laurie had a thyroid condition the way his eyes bulged? Oh, no, I haven't. I just thought he was, you know, it was just part of where he was from, just their physical features. Is that a, a is that a condition? A side of- he was from the land of Ibulgia. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, a that funny was story so was <laughs> th- there was a guy uh, who uh, looked similar to him and he tried to change his name so people would think he was his son and he could get acting roles. It's very funny. I'm really, sure not to roles? Peter Laurie. What? He, he got roles? like some very crappy small roles, but um, I think he was denied the name change. Huh. He was one of the Wookiees in the Star Wars Christmas <laughs> special. Mm. <laughs> All right. That does it for this week's review of M. Thanks again for joining us and listening to our little bi-weekly podcast. If you've had a good time, the fun doesn't have to stop here. You, as we stated before, you can follow us on Facebook at Movie House Memories or on Twitter at MH Memories. On either Facebook or Twitter, you can keep up on our written film reviews, news on upcoming films and Blu-ray releases, and information on upcoming podcasts on the MHN Podcast Network, including... Now i got to get rid of that one now. <laughs> uh, lunchtime Movie Review, Mail Bonding, The Number Two Review, and Movie House Concessions. Again, if you've enjoyed yourselves and you downloaded us off either iTunes or Stitcher, make sure to rate our podcast on either one of those two platforms. And if you have a chance, write a short review of the podcast. Of course, we always like the reviews that are positive, but we appreciate any feedback that we can get from any listeners of the show. Well, that does it for this episode of Movie House Memories. Join us next time when it's Lori's turn to make her next pick for one of the greatest films of all time. And she stays in the 1930s with 1937's Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. Hi, ho. <laughs> Hi yourself. So <laughs> Peter Laurie sang a tune. So. <laughs> Until next time, I'm Patrick. <laughs> I'm Chris. I'm Laurie. And I'm going to go exact some mob justice. And we'll see you next time at our house. This podcast is not endorsed by the Criterion Collection and is intended for entertainment and, inform- and information purposes only. M. All names and sounds of M characters and any other M-related items are registered trademarks and or copyrights of the Criterion Collection or the respective trademark and or copyright holders. 
All original content of this podcast is the intellectual property of the MHM Podcast Network, Movie House Memories, and Fuzzy Bunny Slippers Entertainment, LLC, unless otherwise noted.